and we are live ladies and gentlemen welcome back to another episode of camera and flask i can't recall which one this is looking at the title number five normally quick note this is on wednesdays at 6 p.m episode of camera and flask, um, I eastern recall. time so stay tuned for that that's where our regular time we are kind of messing around with the schedule just this week so it's kind of a special episode here on thursdays my name is Caleb Pike. I run DSLR Video Shooter. Currently, we are on the lovely Jem Schofield's channel, the C47, and he is our captain. Uh, I'm just doing our little intro here today. So trickle in, trickle in, find yourself a beverage. We're going to sit back, talk about the business of video production and some uh, interesting topics there. So really looking forward to it. So Jem Schofield, tell us about C47 uh hello hello everybody i'm not the captain this is a three captain ship here at camera and flask but uh gem here from the c47 a little bit of video production a little bit of filmmaking a little bit of consulting a little bit of education and a lot of love for cameras and flasks uh <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's the deal. And here we go with Mr. Ben Barden, uh, who always comes in to us at the latest time uh, because he is. Are you currently in the Czech Republic? No, I'm at my mum's tonight. So I'm in the I'm in the Lake District. Um, yeah, this has been since we started this show. I have been traveling pretty much nonstop. I don't think I've done two episodes in back to back locations, have I? I think we've no. been all over. And interestingly, in two weeks time, so next week I might be here, I think, I won't be at home, uh, but in two weeks time, the episode is going to be coming from possibly the most extreme remote location imaginable. I'm but excited to, about that. I need to make sure my clients call it, but yeah, I'm going to be filming on an oil rig. Um, that would be the, amazing. Uh, in the Arctic Circle, so I'm going to... Hammerfest, which is the most northerly town in the world, if you yes. count the town as anything more than 5,000 people. And then I get on a helicopter and fly for two hours north of there. So That's amazing. They have good internet, apparently. So we'll, we'll see if they're cool with me doing the show from there. <laughs> I want to see but, you out like on the deck. With the like, northern lights behind. Yes, and like a, yes. one of those like nasty on-camera lights with your big fluffy coat and the whole yeah. thing. I'm yeah. guessing you didn't make it to Poland this year, unfortunately. No, that will be going next week. So I've got another job on a different oil rig next week. Um, okay. And just, yeah, things are kind of chaotic, which is great. It's really nice because there's some really good, interesting jobs coming in. But the logistics of organizing all that stuff is just, yeah. Insane. Insane. But all good. Good, good. Very positive, definitely. Good. Okay, right. well, uh, Caleb, what do we start off with uh, every week on Cameron Flask? Probably the most important part of the show, even though First it's the shortest. First, we're going to start uh, by cracking open our beverages of choice this week. Yes. Uh, the other fine two gentlemen normally have something extravagant, uh, exquisite, and just truly, truly wonderful this week uh -huh. <laughs> for me. <laughs> Here we uh, go. There we go. <laughs> Keep it consistent. We're, we're gonna do, yeah, right. Uh, we're gonna do four roses bourbon. Oh, that's that's good stuff. There we go. That's not the the worst thing in the world. No, that's a okay. good. That's a good. I mean, you know, it's it's not Booker's. I mean, a Scotsman would not drop this off at my front door or or no no <laughs> wonderful story like that. Yeah. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Uh, forty percent. We'll just do a little sip and see what things look like and uh, go from there. But I would I would say that the Scotsman would drop that at your front door as a re-gift. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. So that's what I'm drinking. Uh, How about yourself, Jem? Oh, okay. Uh, I am drinking. So I was in the fine state of Wisconsin last week. Uh, I was technically going to Milwaukee. But I landed at an airport that is Milwaukee Airport, just south of the city, and I just drove um, kind of past Milwaukee and went north to a suburb and lived there for five days. But uh, when I was in my hotel, I had this beer here. Uh, New Glarus is the brewing company, and it is called Spotted Cow. And it is a farmhouse ale. I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as a farmhouse ale 
What's a farmhouse like you would, ale? Well, like a saison. So no, they call sorry, them, sorry. Hang on. You, what's a saison? What do you mean? I've never, I've never heard that. It's, From this Belgium. Must be, this was no, that's a Belgium uh, saison. That's a Belgian beer. S a i s o n. Go ahead, look it up. I, I promise. But this is really not like a traditional saison. But they call it a farmhouse ale, at least on their bottles, but not on their cans. And here's the interesting thing about Spotted Cow: you can only buy this in Wisconsin. So there's no other state that has this beer. So when you're at the airport, which is a tiny little airport, there was like a hundred people there when I was leaving. There's just boxes and boxes of Spotted Cow. And because I had had one, I was like, okay, I got to buy a 12-pack of Spotted Cow. So that's what I'm drinking, Spotted Cow, Glarus Brewing Company, Glarus, Wisconsin. Out of a jam jar. Well, I thought it would be appropriate to have it out of a mason jar. I don't know. Wisconsin, maybe that's wrong. But I just felt like no, it's let's nice. just do it's, it. I like it. Yeah, it's good. It's Thank good. you. So, and so Ben, ben with your really yeah, with your extraordinary cool. scotch, let's see what it is. Of course, we'll, in mom's we'll house. Actually, wait to sip until all the gentlemen have their their drinks poured. Jen. Ah, there we go. Oh my <laughs> god. Oh, I'm sorry. That's so horrible of me. I'm rude. Okay, it's a space side, so it's, it's not going to be not going to be too peaty, not too smoky. Right? No, kind of easy, much easier drinking in space. And this is the first alcohol I have touched since we lasted the show. Hmm. I thought you were going to say since eight o'clock this morning. But no, okay. this, is, this is the like longest I've given that I drink for a long, long time. That's so. incredible. Mm. Okay, that really is. Okay, so here we go. This is a cheers to the gentleman and to everybody else who's here at the at the chat on the live stream. And I'll here do we go. And we'll uh, address those people. But gentlemen, episode five. Cheers. Slow check. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Best comment so far. <laughs> it's <laughs> this session is a counter to Joe Rogan's experience. Question mark. <laughs> Speaking of the chat, just want to shout out everyone who's already in there. We got Harrison. How you doing, Harrison? Part time films. Guillermo. Uh, Guillermo. No, that's Guillermo. That's Memo Montesinos, my friend from Mexico City. Memo. Memo. Yeah. Got it. Pinche, got pinche it. huevos. Okay, there you go. Uh, Gerald, original video reviews, and I think that's everybody. I see there's other people watching, so if you're just yes. a lurker, please jump in. We love uh, hearing from everybody. This is often a discussion, so we're going to be jumping into um, this topic today, and we would love to hear your feedback throughout the conversation. Any questions, any comments, any uh, input, please, please let us know. Love it. Yeah, and as I like to say on every episode of Cameron Flask, um, you know, this is about everybody who comes to the live stream. And while we will have a topic every single week, uh, forum is open for anything related to camera, lighting, grip, um, general technology related to video production and filmmaking. This, I think, is our first episode that is not really gear related at all. It really has to do with the business side of things. It has to do with what we're all dealing with uh, in greater or lesser degree uh, or to a greater or lesser degree related to getting work and being in the business. So um, I think we should jump into it a little bit. And then we're hoping that in the chat that everybody jumps in and asks questions, makes comments and everything else. And Caleb, you are part-time films digital sensei. So just remember that, okay? You think that, that when he shows up that things are okay and we can relax, but really it's you who are making us relaxed, okay? <laughs> just remember that, golden child. Okay, Thank so part-time. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, okay, so how about, uh, Caleb, you, you tell us a, a little bit about what we're talking about today, and then uh, we'll get Ben in here, and then uh, we'll just round robin it, and everybody jumps in with the conversation. Boom. All right, so today we're talking about in-house production, how it's affecting your business. So that whole idea of, um, you know, back in the day, all of us had our own production companies or were freelancers. These days, we're seeing kind of that shift of a lot of companies having in-house video departments. So hiring a person or people to do regular video work. And we're gonna be discussing how that's affecting production companies, freelancers. Uh, please let us know if you're in one of those sides of this whole uh, interesting, there's no bad guy here. It's just, you know, 
times change. And uh, I think it's important to stay on top of all that stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm going to, I'd love to hear from Ben. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, you want to start us off here on what, what you, how you feel about all this stuff? Maybe uh, where, how you seen this shift or lack it's, thereof over there? Well, it's kind of, I, I started as an in-house. So I, my first proper job was, I was the, um, photographer the in-house photographer there's a little bit of video but it was mainly stills photography for the the tourist board so that's the um the marketing agency that markets the lake street national park and um, as a tourist destination so it was a great job it was one of those where you you get the job and then you cut your teeth very quickly learn a lot do a lot of seminars there wasn't a lot of online at the time mm. um and then since then then i went freelance after Three years, and I pretty much kept working for those same for that same company for a long time. Uh, I managed to negotiate a contract whereby I would just keep doing my job, but doing it for myself and building a business. So I was very lucky in the way that that started. And then I guess I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, things things did start to drop off, and there was definitely in stills as well. There was this: we've all got a phone, and companies I think have gone away from that a little bit. But for a while there. The photography side did drop off a lot and that was probably why i started doing far more video because that wasn't quite as accessible um and now we're in this place where for me i think there's there's a lot of that going on in terms of the in-house stuff and i don't think it's affecting me from my freelance work too much at the moment i think the companies that I'm dealing with, they often have people in-house, but they bring people in for the bigger project because the in-house stuff is the dailies. It's the stuff that they're never going to pay us to do because the volume of it is just so huge for a lot of companies now. Um, mm. and, and so I'm still getting work from companies that have their own in-house people as well at the moment. So that's where, where things are sitting with me. How about you, Jim? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, my perspective might be a little bit different than almost anybody else's because about 20 to 30 percent of what I do is education. And so what I've seen uh, after teaching for a long time, um, probably coming on 17 or 18 years now, is that in the last especially I would say last three years, that huge, huge numbers of people who are showing up to classes and workshops that I'm doing are in-house production. And it used to be that most people were freelance or they had a production company or a combination of both of those. And occasionally you get somebody showing up from a company. But now it's people showing up from, you know, everything from Google to sci-fi channel to working for uh, a law firm. And they're creating a lot of video-based content because they've realized, um, and I think rightfully so, that when at a certain point they started to create so much video-based content on a regular basis for their brand, their products and or services, and they were going outside all of the time that it made perfect sense for them to bring in and create a small in-house team, unfortunately, usually just one person for that one person, and create in-house production. And so um, I, I think the numbers, I talked to Caleb about this earlier on, I think the numbers are getting close to about 85% of the people who are showing up to workshops are working in-house for companies, creating content. That many. Uh, so, Oh yeah, yeah, it's it's a humongous. That doesn't mean that 85% of the people in our industry are working in-house, but it is huge. I mean, I just went to NBC Universal about three or four weeks ago, and I taught a group of about 30 people one day who shoot for Sci-Fi Channel, and another 30 people or so the next day who shot for USA Network slash Oxygen, and they're in-house. Now that makes sense, NBC Universal. But then I've gone out and done stuff for Walmart Films, Chorus Entertainment in Canada. Uh, and then today I spoke to a company that's based in New York that's a law firm that wants to train five to seven people in next year on small to no crew production. So um, it's pretty interesting. 
uh, how much the industry, I think, has shifted. And again, when you're tasked with creating one to 10 videos every month, why are you going outside unless that project's a larger project? So they're bringing people in-house. And of course, some of the people who are coming in-house are exactly the people that we were talking about uh, or I was teaching before, which are the freelancers. Uh, yeah. It's kind of the opposite of what you did, uh, Ben, but they're the, the freelancers or the independent producer directors who maybe are losing work and then they're taking a job and basically running up a department, uh, sometimes a department of one in-house. Yeah. So I guess that's sort of the initial part of it. Um, I think uh, we've got some questions here though, Caleb. Maybe we can start up with, um, uh, we'll start with original video reviews and down from there where there's some comments. What do we have? Even when you're, you're a freelancer, you need to deal with politics in your business, question mark. Is that a question? Um, I don't know if that's a question. I think it's a question. So what about Gerald? What level of in-house are we talking about? Um, I think we're talking about all levels, right? Yeah. Caleb and Ben? Yeah. Yeah. I think that this discussion is open to all levels. So this is a, this is a small to medium sized company that has one person that's tasked with being a producer, a director, a director of photography, a camera operator, an editor, a sound recordist, all of that stuff. And then it's bigger companies where they may have teams, but oddly enough, or maybe not so the sci-fi channel, uh, USA networks thing, you would think, okay, they're going out in crews of five to eight people. No, they're going out with one to two people. So it's still one to two person crews who are creating all these content, you know, all the content. They're going out and you know covering Comic Con and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think any size. Uh, what questions do we have here, Caleb? That would be good ones for us to get um, into. A lot of a lot of comments uh, or, or people, uh, you know, talking about the subject like Harrison. Um, same thing. Harder and harder to find freelance gigs. Uh, so he now works at a university in house. Yeah, that's yeah. big. A lot of people I've, I've done training for work for universities. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I used to I used to do university work, and I think I'm probably not doing as much university work because of that reason. I used mm -hmm. to do fundraising mm -hmm. videos, and we used to do admissions videos. I'm not saying that there isn't any of that work anymore, but I think that they're starting to build some of that in-house. And, and, yeah. and, and as well with the universities and with the higher education sector. There's a lot of that that they get someone in that manages it, but then they use their their film students for a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I see that happening a lot. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I just make a comment really quickly, and then we can get on with the rest of the topic? Um, when I was in Wisconsin, I probably had a two, maybe a three finger pour of scotch before I tried this spotted cow, <laughs> and and that's all I have to say about that. I, I wish I wish I had another drink here right now, and I'm Jen, sorry, Wisconsin. Jen. Yeah, you know, you know, does it taste like it looks? And you know what it looks like. Hold it up, hold it up. I'm keeping myself on the small. Image it it does. It it does look like the first pee of the morning. That's is that what it tastes like? I, I'm not talking about this anymore. Let's go back to Caleb now. Okay. Come on, what? <laughs> 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 it's, I, I want to run and go get a different drink, but that's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it together here. Here we go. Okay. 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 So, um, it sounds like, yeah, several people here, um, same situations. Um, so yeah, it's clearly a thing. Um, do you want to talk about what to do about it? My, my position, I never was uh, a full production house, right? So I was mainly a freelancer. Um, and then I, Jem kind of did that 50 50, right? Or that, that kind of you did some education, you also did production, you still do that today. Mm -hmm. um, I was all production, and then just slowly the channel grew, and then it got to the point where I was only doing a couple big, big gigs a year. And I decided it was uh, time to pull the plug because I personally have found for certain like YouTube, uh, it's just too much for me to do both. Um, so it was easier for me to clean cut. Um, so I, I, I never had a full production house, but I have several friends who have been in that position um, who, you know, close up shop and end up doing in-house. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it is just after years and years of running your own ship, uh, it just gets so stressful. And the thought of a consistent job sounds really nice. Benefits, it's, you know, yeah, all oh, that yeah. stuff. 
Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. You have something to um, say there, Ben? Tell well, me. I did, just complete, I'm often tempted by that as well. And, and I think particularly freelance, and I, I don't know, well, I know you're the same because we've always talked about this for as long as I've known you, that, that when you're freelance, it's, it's, I think most people I know that are freelance go through the feast and famine cycle. Mm. So you're either, yep. you have nothing. So this summer, I've had a terrible summer mm. to work. Mm -hmm. Now, and to me being all over the place, um, you're now kind of stressed the other way because you've got so much on. You're struggling to, to cope with doing all of that and organizing yep. everything else. And you, you're doing one job and your mind's not wholly on it because you've got to figure out the next one. And it's, you know, it's, it's always that. It's very rare that you get a, a period of time when everything's just uh, a nice balance. Um, and, yep. and, and it's so appealing to, to work regular hours, to be paid overtime, to be... Going home, I was working for it. Look at him, he's got a smile on his face. Have you got another drink coming? Oh, my God. This is amazing. This is, <laughs> it's amazing what's happening. This is probably the best thing that's happened to me all week. <laughs> Un yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. You're the best. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's, I mean, that is amazing. Yes. This man knows his priorities. <laughs> Holy cow. You lit up. Like someone just came in here with the, the winning lottery ticket and put it in they your They did. I'm, I'm excited. It's not, I mean, you know, it's not the, the top shelf, but this is a, a Glenlivet 12, and it's a it's a completely, you know, respectable, um, I wouldn't say everyday drink because I don't drink every day, but uh, this will do just fine. And there's, I definitely like it more than the, you know, some of the other ones out there, so. There you go. But it's better than the it's not a cool Ayla. It's not a cool Ayla, but I really, I do, you know, sometimes I'll just, I'll settle on the Glenlivet 12. It's mm -hmm. been in the rotation for a long time. So I'm very happy. <laughs> good, good. All right. Um, with that fixed now and uh, no spotted cow. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that we, we have to find that balance for me. It's uh, oh, I didn't even, yeah, here it is guys. Boom. There I was on the small little, you know, thing so um it's a roller coaster you know being a freelancer which is i think one of the other reasons that a lot of people are attracted to going in-house because there's some stability there i've been doing it for um over 20 years now so at this point i don't really know anything other than this life of uh of you know ups and downs and so it is that feast or famine uh, both Ben and I have, uh, as does Caleb, we have, you know, more than one kid. And so we have to think about all of those aspects of it, but that's just the way I'm in it right now. But I have seen some ramifications, even though I would say that, you know, none of us are putting all of our eggs in one basket completely. Um, and, and I think that that's true for you as well, Caleb. I mean, a lot of people may have this perception that you're putting all of your attention on your YouTube channel, but you're, you're very intelligent and you are thinking about not only that platform not being the only place where you may push content to, but you're also creating different types of content um, that not everybody may be aware of. So you do your camera guides and other things, and you've talked about it um, you know, on your channel a lot. So diversification is important in terms of the types of work that you're doing. Uh, we can fall into this trap that we have you know, a single client that's bringing in 80% of our income. And if we settle into that uh, groove and we get comfortable, and that's true of being a YouTube creator you know, uh, as well, then that whole bottom can fall out at a certain point in time. So I think that in all in our own way, we've tried to figure out ways to um, take what we do and split it up. I started to do some consulting and some equipment design stuff. Um, I started to try to leverage that little lane that I have, which is creating educational content um, and, and you know working with companies related to that. And, um, and I still primarily do production work, but I do find that um, this in-house creative is definitely having an effect. And I'll talk a little bit about it, if you remind me in a little while, guys, about the idea of specializing in certain types of content for companies that may have in-house, that may separate you a little bit from what they're doing on a regular basis every single day so that you can still have potential value to companies that have in-house production. Um, yeah. So what do we have? Uh, is there any comments here that would be worth? Have you been reading some of these, Caleb, that make yeah. sense for us to? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Um, 
let's see here. You know, people talking about similar similar stuff. Um, uh, Gerald says, yeah, I find it uh, hard to manage other work now that I'm dedicated so much time to my channel. It's fine, easier to mix. Yeah. Um, to check. Where's the one I was reading here? Um, okay, so here's someone who moved uh, Rimrock from in-house to freelance three years ago. Uh, best opportunities are in that mid to high tier. Yeah, off to in -house absolutely. Nice quantity over quality, which makes you know sense. Yeah. Uh, no, that's true. Um, I, I can speak to that, and then I think we should bring up Harrison's uh, comment too, which I think is actually an interesting one that I have some experience with. So Rimrock, um, it's uh, for me, it's coming in and being a specialist where I might A, come in and help them set up their in-house. So it's not always about fighting the in-house component. It's saying, you know, um, you know, what kind of content are you guys trying to create? You get into a conversation and maybe you help them build out their studio. You help them with a little bit of consulting. Uh, there may be an educational component to that. And then long term, that can create opportunity that when in-house can't produce something, they essentially become the executive producer and they hire somebody outside to produce a larger project. So I found that that's happened sometimes. They might want to shoot a commercial or something else that they just don't have the resource, uh, resources for in-house to do. Um, and then Harrison said, I found one of the biggest killers uh, for local work is the is not being able to compete with local TV stations, uh, low, low prices. And I've actually done a lot of education for uh, news and uh, you know local affiliate stations. And there's a component of that where they, they have sales teams that go out and they sell essentially inexpensive commercials for local businesses. And that is uh, definitely something that can affect you, uh, especially if people want to be you know, uh, broadcast on traditional media as opposed to the web. So um, yeah, so I think it's pretty interesting overall. Um, Ben, what about you? Uh, right now, you maybe not can talk about it in its entirety, but you're working on something right now. Um, is there something interesting about that project that relates to anything that we're talking about right now at all? Yeah, I, th I think uh, to make expanding from what you were saying about what else you can offer that the in-house teams can't, and for me with the oil and gas work that I'm doing, so I'm doing uh, a really interesting one next week, which is actually for a, a docs and branded content um, for a guy that actually it's featuring a guy that works in it and I'm, I'm covering the bit uh, of his working life on the oil rig because I've got the tickets I've got the qualifications and the experience to do it so that's mm. kind of a really niche thing for me it's really expensive to keep up with those tickets there's very few people have them um, that do what we do so I do get work and again it, it sort of depends a bit on the oil price and you know, whether people are spending money on marketing or whatever at any given time um, but that's that's a good little niche thing that not a lot of people do and aren't qualified to do. So yep. yesterday I had to go do some extra training because I'm going to be working in the Norwegian sector, um, in the oil and gas industry, which has a different escape system from the oil rigs. So I had to go and do a, an hour's training on their escape system. It's, and it's keeping up with all of that and the medical qualifications and the insurance and all of that that a lot of people don't have. Um, but again, Going back to what you were saying about working with companies to develop their own in-house, I do that as well. So helping them set up building blocks. I have a, a client and who I still do work for as well. He has a motorcycle shop and he's an ex-motorcycle racer. And they've got a great guy that's um, a good editor that does their web stuff as well. And he's we set up a little studio upstairs and he's well known. So he goes up every time there's a new product, he gets some footage of his GoPro of him mm. on track. Mm. And then he's a really good presenter. So he goes and does that. And he just, like, I just need to be churning this stuff out every single day, every new product that comes through. I need to be talking about it. And that works well. And I know that I still get work from them for the bigger stuff. And you know, we're working with them. It's, and it also kind of, with a bigger company, if you're doing that, it also sells you as being an expert in your field too. If you've gone and set it all up, you're the go-to guy for when things go wrong or we need something more complicated. Yeah. Well, uh, Chris just commented, and Chris happens to be uh, in Canada's northern oil sector. So mm -hmm. gives him something to think about. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, 
yeah, I think that specializing is not a bad way to go. I'm not saying it's going to be easy or easier, but if you understand that you can't compete directly with in-house production, but you approach a company with the acknowledgement that they're doing in-house and if they have any larger projects or they need any consulting in terms of expertise to help that group be more effective at what they're doing. Or you can offer yourself up even as a freelancer because very oftentimes I will tell you from experience, from educating these people, that they sometimes only have one person, at best two people in-house. And so they get overwhelmed. And at a certain point in time, when they have enough workload, they're going to have to go and hire some outside freelancers. So you can market yourself as a producer director, or you can market yourself as a freelancer and say, you know, if you need somebody and you're available, it could also be your ticket into in-house. Um, so not everybody just wants to be a freelancer or have their own production company. So acknowledging that there's that in-house component, acknowledging that you may not you know, be looking for a job there or that you're trying to actively get one, but that you're available if they need somebody in the freelance market could also be something uh, that could be worthwhile for you to take a look at. Um, for you two guys. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. How do you, if you don't mind me interrupting. How do you oh, oh. Um, feel about retain being on retainer with companies? Mm. That's another, you know, because I, I know of people that that's something they they uh, keep in their back pocket or end up doing or have done, you know, when when things are kind of slow to get something on the calendar, you know? Uh, I think it's great. Likewise. I just, I, I just think you have to, um, you have to find that line between pricing yourself realistically so that you don't get yourself into the resentment zone. You know, mm -hmm. that's a very, that's a very easy place to get yourself into as a freelancer and as an independent production company, which is that you're hungry for a short period of time, sometimes a long period of time and you sell yourself short because you'll never be able to make more money with that client once you set your baseline. And anytime you set your, your price point here, um, based on hopefully correct estimation, being as transparent as possible and being honest with your client, and then they say, oh, by the way, we don't have as much budget, but we need the same amount of work, and you go to here, you'll never get back up to here. It'll yeah. always be here or lower from there on out. So um, that's a really tough place to be, and I've lost work for sure in the past when I have held my ground, not to say I'm expensive, because I'm not. I'm not in the low tier. I'm definitely not in that high tier. I sort of sit somewhere in the, in the, you know, in the middle road uh, in terms of where I price stuff based on the industry. My, my, my rates and the crews that I hire rates-wise that I give with my budget estimates are definitely in line with you know, sort of that middle tier of things. And uh, I think it's super important that you have to be able to waste work sometimes even when it's almost impossible to pay your bills because the long-term ramification of that will be, um, if you take the work, not good at all. And you'll have a lot of busy work. Somebody made a comment earlier on about, you know, lower price or, or when people, you know, when people get you for, for lower price work, they tend to be the clients that um, are the hardest to deal with. They're the yeah. ones that you have to handhold the most or they're the biggest pain in the ass or whatever it's going to be. There's a lot of truth to that because what they're doing is they're, they're negotiating you down to begin with. And then that is saying, okay, so we're in for this ride for the, for the long term. And it doesn't, you know, because it has to, look, it's, it's, ne it's not going to happen 100% of the time. But to me, the ideal is that there's mutual respect and admiration on both sides, right? You have to have an admiration for what that company or client is doing, and then they have to have some respect. And the reason that they're hiring you is because of your expertise and what you can produce for them. This is a huge subject that we can talk about. I mean, we can do a, a million live streams about this whole thing. Uh, but I think it's incredibly important. So if you're going to go retainer, I think, A, it has to be something you're somewhat interested in. You have to have some unique perspective to it. There has to be some contribution creatively from you. And then I think it's totally fine because you're sort of creating this with the client, and it's something that is going to bring at least, hopefully, for 6 to 12 months some predictable income. I mean, I have a basically a retainer with Abel Cine, 
I'm producing content for them on a regular basis. And we said, okay, here's a budget for the year. And it's effectively in its own right, a retainer. And there's no problem with that, you know, and I'm, I'm making maybe a little bit less per video than I would if I was doing a one-off for a client, but I'm making enough exchange in quantity that it makes sense for me to do it. And then I think both sides win in that kind of situation. Ben? Uh, yeah, so just, and again, being very strict with whatever you agree that retainer includes and sticking to it because it's, it's not just the negotiation at the beginning, it's that that always trying to just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's that's something that's tricky. Uh, there's a question from Ryan. Can you talk about contracts, agreements, yeah, insurance sure. for productions, gear, live streaming for clients, and one man band production company perspective? Okay. Yeah, so, not, which, I, which one? I thought that was really interesting. Like that's, that's the next four, next four shows sorted there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that could be a really interesting specialty. And believe it or not, there's a lot of that right now. All these companies are getting all antsy to do live streaming. Mm hmm. So if you became an expert in live streaming, that could be a wonderful thing to have under your belt because everyone wants Facebook Live, Instagram Live, uh, YouTube now. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to give everything away when you when you meet with a prospective client. That's that's important. Um, but, you know, Guillermo made a point. I think the companies underestimate that the pros still can solve the problems better than the rookies. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a rookie, but there is something to be said about going in and having a perspective about and getting an understanding of what a company's brand stands for and then being able to help them solve some problems. I don't want to be their marketing department, um, and I talk about this a lot in workshops. I don't want to be their problem solver as uh, as their marketing you know, division. I'm not that. But I do need to understand what their brand stands for, what their products and their services are, and I need to help them communicate to their audience or audiences effectively. Um, and so I think that you know when we start to talk about specializing in something, one of the things that I've realized is that education is a hot topic as well as live streaming and things like that. Um, you sell products and services more effectively today through education than you do through selling in a more traditional way. And so n most of us, I would imagine almost everybody who's here in the live stream, uh, I'd say the three of us, we don't like used car salespeople. You know, we are interested in watching something related to any industry or topic that we're going to learn something from. It doesn't mean that it has to be traditional whiteboard. You are going to learn this today. But if the content teaches you something and doesn't push the product and or service, I think we're far more receptive to that way of producing content. I mean, effectively, that's what you're doing, Caleb, uh, in terms of building your brand you are doing it in a more traditional educational way, but you're creating educational content, which is building your brand. You're not charging your viewers for that um, unless they buy a camera guide and they see value in what you're doing in terms of DSLR video shooter and the type of content that you're providing them. And then they might turn around and say, oh, I'm going to buy this camera. I just bought this camera. I know that I'm gonna get exceptional educational content from this person, so they go ahead and do that. But what's to say that a financial company couldn't create an ongoing series of content where they're teaching you about things having to do with the financial industry that most other companies don't teach you about? I have and so you're exactly that. Exactly yeah, and that. so they have a round table or whatever it is, and then all of a sudden they become the opinion leaders, they become the experts in the area because you're teaching them about something that is a mystery based on every other company that's out there. So you take the mysteries away and then people are stuck to your brand. They, I mean, Canon has been, I would say, exceptional at doing this. Canon has created more free educational content around their camera systems than any other company combined. And as a result, their brand is sticky. It doesn't mean that they always come out with the best camera or the camera that's best for every single person, but because they're educating people, they are creating brand loyalty. 
And it's a pretty interesting thing. So I think that, you know, as a content creator, one of the things that you can look at is going into a company and saying, I can help you educate your customers on what you do and not being hard sell um, and that kind of stuff. Any feelings, uh, Caleb, from your perspective on that kind of idea? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think um, I have a friend who uh, his big thing that he chose or he just started, you know, parading uh, years ago was um, he got so tired of all these producer directors like trying to make the next Sundance film for a client that makes rubber made lids, you know, and uh, he just made this decision forever ago that his number one thing with all his projects was, you know, the ones that weren't the fun stuff was just going to be figuring out how to make sales, just sell, mm. sell, sell, sell. So um, obviously he tried to make it look as good as possible, but if that's your main goal with video, because I think there's thousands of stories of people hiring a company to shoot an ad and nothing happens of it, except they get a right. massive you know, bill. So uh, in today's world, if that's your primary thing is trying to help these companies actually sell their widgets or their services, no matter what it takes, I mean, you're not going to run out of work, right? <laughs> if they see massive results from whatever kind of campaigns they're working on. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's an interesting with clients that they, they frequently don't know what, why. Often the, the first meeting, they go, well, we want a video. And then I, I always ask the same things. Okay, so what do you want it to do? What's the end game? What's, what are you, are you selling? Is it brand awareness? What are we doing? And who's the audience? Who's your who's your demographic? Because that obviously influences massively what we come up with. And it's amazing how frequently the answer is, oh, I don't know, we just got a video. And they don't really know what it's for. But until you get that focus in, listen, you, just, you can go make something beautiful and pretty, but it might not do what it needs to do for you. Yeah. I, I think the other thing you can do is you can go in and, you know, we all creatively have things that we're interested in. And I think that most of us as storytellers will gravitate to something. Yeah. Some people might gravitate to creating content that's around building something. Other people might gravitate to creating content that's around food or travel or whatever it is that they're really interested in. And one of the things that you can do is you can identify businesses that are in your area that are related to the things that you are interested in outside of video production and filmmaking. And very casually go to those businesses and say, I'm doing a, a documentary short project where I'm just interested in this particular area, strike up a relationship with that business. And to feed your soul a little bit, go ahead and start creating some content with them. Um, do your standard stuff, have them sign releases and all the fun stuff, but Really, what you're doing is you're creating a long-term project, but you're also starting to understand more about that industry and what it's doing and potentially can give you the opportunity to maybe not get paid work from that particular company or business, but start to create um, relationships with people in the industry and in a non-threatening way. And then eventually you become the resource when they think, oh, we've got to create a video for something or we have to do something. And you're putting yourself in a position that has to do with something that you're already really interested in overall. And then you can you know, start to do some stuff that's more related with that. There's a lot of different ways to do it because there was a comment about getting in with local breweries or, and small breweries as clients. And you, know, you might start out as a, as a customer or something like that, but that relationship can grow from there overall in terms of what you're doing. Um, and I think, you know, people don't like hard sell very much. I think that they like to be, you know, they like lifestyle based stuff. They like stuff that's uh, conversational. You know, at the end of the day, uh, generationally, I think the younger people are, the less they want to be told to call a 1-800 number or show up somewhere for a super amazing sale. And they want to have a, an educational soft sell about things. And the more you do that consistently as a business, meaning that we get in there and we help a business do that, 
um, the more potentially successful they can be either in a local community or in a broader space if um, you know that's where they want to go. Um, Aperture is a perfect example. It's been mentioned a couple of times in here, the lighting company. Um, Aperture is selling their products through education. There's no question about it. And sometimes they, they rarely say, we are going to shoot a video about the 120D2. You'll do a little marketing thing with a fancy little video with lots of haze and all that kind of shit. And, you know, they're going in with the, yeah. with the slow-mo. But the reality is that the vast majority of their content is educational. And then you'll have Julia Swain say, oh, yeah, I, almost like an aside. You know, it's like, okay, I have a 300D over there and I've got a 120D over there. But really it's about how did they light the scene? Yep. And that is the secret sauce right there. And if you can do that for other companies who are in other industries, I think it's huge. That Caleb. and they, they stuff the internet with their lights. Oh my God. Like yeah. If you got well, Rode did that too, right? Rode right. is the same. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's brilliant. Aperture, if someone's like, I've got 200 subscribers, Aperture's like, hey, you want a 120D? Here you go. <laughs> and then they're everywhere. And like, it's been coined by now. Uh, the 120D is the YouTuber setup. Like the 120D with the light dome. That's it's it. the YouTuber light, which it does and so much more than that. So much more, but that's, it's amazing. But that's all you need in, in, in some respects for at least a period of time. And then you grow and you create more products, right? right? But right. I, it's absolutely genius. And to them, think about it. And you can talk about your potential clients the same way. The cost is so much less than what they would have to spend if they wanted to spend money on marketing and promotion. To send somebody a 120D who has 500 subscribers, even if they sell one light <laughs> because of that content, it's a win. Two lights? You know, they're laughing and uh, and it's usually much greater than that. So I think um, it's definitely important. Um, yeah, I know part time films. You never win an aperture, but um, push that YouTube channel and they'll send you a light. Keep going. Um, so interesting. Chris says with small breweries, people really want to know as much as they can about the beer they drink, show them what the brewery is all about and attract some customers with similar values. I think that's true. I mean, there's no reason why if you love beer, why you can't, and you're in an area, let's say you live in Bend, Oregon, or you're down in San Diego or something like that. Why don't you go to two of your favorite breweries and say, Hey, look, I'm, uh, you know, uh, let me show you some of my work. Hopefully you've got decent work. And I would really love to start doing some work in this area. Um, you know, would you guys be open to me doing a little promotional piece for you for the homepage of your website and you do it for nothing, you know, um, you know, say I'll do it for a, an annual membership for my beer or whatever it is. So you get the uh, Imperial pint instead of the regular pint. You don't know about that Ben over here, but there's some scams going on in terms of the amount of beer you get in these places, what really? they call a pint. Yeah. Pint's not a pint, but we won't have that discussion right now, even though I just did. Um, so, um, Caleb, what you yes. got? Yeah. What I'm thinking is, um, as we approach our final moments together this evening, yes, um, sir. you guys want to talk about maybe some strategy looking forward. Um, if things aren't looking good, what are some things people can start to consider? I know there's, um, I trying to remember who, but someone said something that really stuck to me. And if you get in that rut where all you're doing is rubber made lid, and die mm -hmm. corporate gigs. Yeah. Uh, and you want to go shoot, you know, skateboarders in Los Angeles or whatever, whatever it's right. going to be. Um, how do you make that jump? And this person I can't recall had talked about how um, you need to immediately start making that stuff. Uh, yeah. No matter what it takes and build up. You can't just expect to get a phone call or no. your business card. Um, so if people are, are in the chat or out there watching this later who are just sick and tired of where they're at, they're watching it kind of go downhill. They've had a drought for two, three years. They're not seeing that good season kick back in. What are some words for those folks from you guys? Hmm. Ben. Well, I think it's, it's, first? It, yeah. Okay. I would say get, do some passion projects. Those things hmm. I find have probably got me more work than anything else. 
and they're a pain in the ass because they're always an awful lot more work and time involved than you think they're going to be. But you do those things because you and you make a nice job of them, and they normally have strong story. And those things tend to be the things that get shared. They get your name about. And if there's an area you want to get into, just like Jen was saying before with the breweries, go do one, do it for free. Don't do it cheap. Do it for free, and then charge properly for it for the next one. Mm -hmm. A good, good friend of mine told me that advice when I was saying it. There'll be certain things that are worth doing and you do them for nothing or you charge full money. You don't do not do cheap, which I think is pretty good advice, really. But just do start making the content and making the, which will then get you the contact in that world. Um, and, and find out how to get, you know, if it's a certain industry that you're wanting to get into, to make a certain type. Even just doing things that aren't necessarily about the filmmaking side initially to get those contacts, go make friends with those people first because we all like doing business with people that we like to socialize with, to hang out with. Um, so again, you know, I, I get a lot of work from from people who I would consider friends. So that's another way. In. Yeah, and I think that um, you have to remember, and I have a comment here that I need to acknowledge in a second. You have to really remember that um, unless you're talking about really, really big national brands and business um, or international brands and businesses, that in one particular community, everybody basically knows each other. So even though they're competitive, and this is really interesting because even in our industry in video production and filmmaking, um, most of the people in all of the competing companies, they're all friends. Some of them are frenemies. Some of them are really close friends. A lot of them move from company to company. There's like a revolving door in terms of who's with whom, and they're just representing a particular brand at that time. So we'll take the breweries as an example and what Ben was talking about. You don't go in and say, I'll do it for half the cost that I normally would, because every other brewery will probably find out what that brewery paid for that work. And then you try to come in at that higher price point and you're effed you're done, right? So you do it for free. You put a lot of passion into it because it's an area you want to get into. And then at that point, you go in and you say, okay, I'm going to do a proper proposal for somebody else because they really liked what was being done. And you make sure you have a bag of dongles, uh, as somebody said here in the in the notes. So uh, Fernie Pad said something that's interesting. Guys, I'm behind on the podcast because I had to hit pause, touching base on the TV stations, having two to three in-house staffers. I am one of those cases and I always need freelancers. So there you go. So, you know, it's like this may be an area that you never even thought about approaching. Every single medium-sized to large city has affiliate stations, right? So maybe you gravitate to one station more than another. So go and approach that station and say, you know, I'm a freelancer in the area. I have these skills. Are you looking for anybody? If they're not, then just drop off your resume, make sure you give them your website and whatever else you have. And uh, I think that that's important to do. And I think that um, that you really have to also produce. Um, I, I think that that sounds a little trite maybe, but um, the, the best thing I ever did back in 2008, when uh, into 2009, where I hadn't worked basically for nine months. I probably made $1,500 and I just had my third kid. I was scared out of my mind, you know, debt up to here was I started the C47 because I wasn't doing anything every day. We all know how to create content. That doesn't mean that everybody wants to start a YouTube channel or do that. So maybe yours is the passion project for a local brewery because you're not getting work. So at least it, you're producing, you're doing something. Um, I've had some ups and downs this year it, in the slow period was really the thing that kicked my ass. And I said, okay, this is the time that I'm going to start Gearbox 2.0 again, because if, if I'm not getting steady work um, or I'm doing a lot of work, that's not creating a lot of income, I need to produce some stuff that I'm interested in and that's going to be worthwhile. And generally that pays off. It's, uh, it's hard. There's going to be, there's going to be the hump and the hump is the hardest part because you're trying to push through it and you're like, I always say the runway is three times longer than you ever think it's going to be. It's always three times longer. So you've got to get past that hump and then something's going to pay off. Your audience is going to grow. The community is going to see the work that you're doing and somebody's going to talk to somebody else. Um, I, I truly believe in that. So I think that that's, you know, pretty interesting. Um, I just thought you got? Uh, one, one more thing just quickly. Yeah. Is that in terms of, of 
searching out work. The other thing is is go and make friends with your competitors because people that are in, in uh, they are my competitors. There are also people that I then go hang out with. Sure. And when they can't do something, they're going to hire you in to go cover it for them a lot of the time. You know, as long as they trust you that you're not going to go and run away with their client, you know, so you've got to behave yourself <laughs> and act with integrity. <laughs> but if that all works and there's people that you trust, then then that's a great source. And again, it's, it's good for um, just general support, having people to talk to that are in the same boat as you, but don't, don't treat your... Um, your competitors are with sort of suspicion and that they're the enemy if you can make friends with those guys and particularly if they're doing well um, take them for a coffee, go and have a beer with them That that's yeah, where I get a fair bit of work from those people yeah, yeah. and Caleb you, you obviously interact with a, a huge audience on a regular basis and you get a lot of feedback and people who are looking for solutions a lot of it is I'm trying to find equipment and things like that um, but I'm sure that you are asked a lot of questions and you have to give some advice. Um, what is it that you think um, a large part of your audience is struggling with and some advice that you could give to them? Because we all suffer from gear lust, or most of us do, and we have this false perception um, that this equipment is going to make us better at telling stories and at doing what we do for a living because we all love to read about and get our hands on this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but ultimately, um, buying that one extra light is not going to make you any better at doing that. And when we talk about doing a job for free, if you go and do a job for free, instead of paying $500 for that light, but you go out and you spend your time to create this content, um, uh, you know, what is it that you can kind of tell some people um, from that standpoint, because I mean, a lot of people are coming to your channel to find and buy gear, yeah. and that's not a bad thing. You know, right. same same with mine. You know, less people. From a but. business perspective, I shouldn't say this, but stop buying gear because because it's coming out every five seconds. They it's won't. Really yeah, it's yeah. okay. Though you can say it all you want. They won't. Yeah. I mean, well, they we won't. True. I could yeah. I could like that could be my main thing going forward on my channel, and people still <laughs> do their thing. But um, I was just doing a collab uh, with a channel that will be doing some cool stuff here for long. And I talked a lot about uh, stop going into debt and stop buying super expensive cameras. Like guys are just like buying, they'll buy like a, a C100 and a C200. Yeah. Um, then they'll get the C300 Mark II. Those cameras prices, they're turning into cars. You yep. drive off a lot and then two years later, their B&H is selling them brand new for, you know, ridiculous price drop yeah so i'm seeing cameras more like underwear you know you swap them out every once in a while so get something that's going to take care of 70 percent of your gigs and right. then uh, rent for the big stuff and then just and be it, smart about it and and people hate this to hear this but start saving you know because I, I i would probably try to get a good uh pretend you're going to have two terrible seasons you know, make sure you have enough to, to in the coffer to uh, get you through that. And yeah, if you want, if you need something to keep going, like if you just can't stop buying stuff uh, and you want to keep improving your videos, uh, you know, vintage lenses or like lighting modifiers, get one killer 300D or 120D or, you know, uh, an airy uh, sky panel and then just modifiers, just because yep. that's where you can have some fun and massively improve your images uh, all without spending, you know, a ton of money. I, I think that's a, that's actually really, really good advice. And I think that, um, you know, learning the craft of lighting is probably one of the most valuable things that you can do and just work on that. And learning is just ongoing. I mean, it's like every day I wake up and I'm like, I look back and I say, I know so much more about lighting than I used to. And then I look at what people are producing um, and I say, I have like the rest of my life to even scratch the surface of learning what those people are doing. And it's exactly what you said. It's, you know, you get that one high output, good quality light nowadays. Okay. Single t color temperature. We've talked about that. I would rather go with something that's bi-color to have some, you know, flexibility in terms of what I'm doing. 
but it's the modifiers. I mean, you know, you can take a light that has decent output that's a hard light and you can make it into a six by six or an eight by eight soft light very, very easily by spending another hundred dollars on something, you know, um, you can stick it through a shower curtain as well. You're just not going to always want to have a shower curtain with you on a production because it's going to make a lot of noise outside. So you might want to get silent grid cloth instead of that. But even that's only going to be 120 bucks, you know, to buy something. So um, I think it's really important. And I think that, um, you know, to your point, Caleb, it, it, you have to find also the right camera for the type of work that you're doing. It doesn't mean that I think you're not saying to people, everybody should go buy an A7 III or a GH5S. Um, if you're doing higher, uh, not higher end, but you're doing the type of work that requires a camera system that has built in XLR inputs because you're hiring a sound recordist to come right. in and, you know, tap into that and you need a uh, time code because you're jam syncing time code. Sure. Do that or rent the cameras and build that mm. into your, uh, your budgets. And I think we go back all the way to those earlier notes, uh, where people are asking about budgeting and all of that kind of stuff. I think we have to make that something that we start to, um, I, I guess we ask everybody here, how many people here are interested in us talking about the business side of this more and more as we go along and getting yeah, involved in those conversations? Uh, what you think there? And the camera thing, I think like on the low end, a GH5, because it's a great all arounder. You slap that little dual XLR on there and you're, you're talking, man for yep. like nothing and yep. then uh, a little little higher uh, like a c200 is just mm. gold i just yeah. bought one this week I'm, I'm talking to the guys who are like thinking about getting a loan to get the new gemini it's like, ridiculous or yeah, Helium, I mean, or whatever it's like come on dude rent it well the, rent there's, it. there's another there's another thing that we were i think gemini i've had this conversation before that i i used to spend you know what it's like because we all love gear and then you end up spending so much of your profit on gear and it's lovely to have, but then because of my slightly weird existence and traveling all the time, and most of my disposable income now goes, which isn't disposable, most of my income goes on plane tickets. And so I, I had to start thinking about each gear purchase, and it had to do, either the client were gonna have to notice a, a real difference, and you were gonna be able to charge more for it, or you're gonna get more work from having that piece of kit, or it was mm. gonna need to make your life more efficient or easier. And if it didn't fulfill one of those two things, then I don't need it. And, this, and the C200 that I've been, because I've had the, C, uh, the FS700 for a long time, and we've been talking for years about what to replace that with. And finally, because of the kind of work that I'm doing, I need I need the weather sealing. I need something that's very dependable, something that doesn't need external recorders, all that stuff. And the C200 is, is that, and the AF, because I'm going to be working on my own and doing yep. it. So that, yeah. that's it. I need that now because I'm going to, cock things up on jobs if I don't have that oh it's going to break but that's been that's been a, a long and, and horrible decision it didn't feel good buying it no it hasn't arrived yet it'll feel better when I open the box I'm sure and start using it but but <laughs> yeah. I mean uh Caleb I mean you know we talk about the C200 let's talk about that as an, an investment and on the high end that's a $7,500 investment sans lenses and you got to get some batteries and media it has a CFast card slot that records in raw it's compressed raw. Most cameras shoot in some sort of form of compressed raw. But I mean, you're talking about the fact that you can go out now and spend $7,500 US on a camera that has a PL mount if you wanted to. Of course, you lose out on the autofocus stuff and that you can shoot raw in for $7,500. So why aren't you renting those higher end cameras and just having something like a C200 as the camera that you know can do your day in and day out work? Or to your point, a GH5S with a speed booster and an XLR, you know, attachment, and you've got a very ND on there, and that will be the right camera for a very large percentage of people as well. Um, it's only getting better and better. I mean, I'm pretty shocked at how good um, what Fujifilm is doing. You know, this X-T3 yeah. is a pretty mm -hmm. amazing camera. You know, it's like everybody's all gaga about full frame, and okay, that's great, but let's not discount the micro four thirds and the, and the APS-C slash super 35 millimeter sensor cameras. Yeah. Um, oh, the, oh, the yeah. really big stuff. I've been shooting with this today. Oh, there you go. We're just waiting for you to pull that out, <laughs> pull that out and swing it around in our faces. That's really nice. Thank you for that. Yes. But did, were you shooting just stills on that or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's cool. So, um, 
so, my last advice while Jim checks the comments or, or whatever you're looking down at over there. Yeah, yeah, uh, the comments. Esports. If I'm in freelance right now looking to like the what's the next big gold rush slash it's not a really a gold rush because it's going to be here forever uh, is uh, esports. This, their, their numbers over there are making the Super Bowl look like, you know, your your aunt's uh, kids. Second so can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, what are you what yeah. are you talking about? Are you talking from a production standpoint? Huh? So esports, video games, competitions, that yep. stuff is 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 making the Super Bowl look like a ballet recital when it comes to eyes. Like the that industry is exploding right now. Uh, so you've, if you have any interest in streaming video at all, uh, there's guys right now who are gone from nobody to rock stars in the kind of doc scene for jumping on the the esports thing because people want to see that there's so many eyes there right now um because think about it, all these kids that are growing up you know their dad's sitting in the chair watching the game and they're in their room watching streamers play you know and compete in Fortnite and all this other stuff who's uh, shooting that stuff it's, it's all I mean, these some, broadcast no, companies I know. Okay. But, but there's nobody really doing the the cinematic doc stuff. So I think it's a So go find those project. people and then oh, yeah. start shooting docs on people in that industry. I yeah, mean like, what they do is they hire these kids and they buy a house and then the kids train like 10 dudes uh for this brand essentially and it's it's becoming a like huge industry. So that, that's what I would be running toward right now if I was uh looking to mix it up a little bit that's pretty fascinating some so cinematic, just cinematic are you saying getting in there and shooting like shooting stuff around some of the biggest people in that industry yeah follow a player or two who are at the top of their game um because these kids are dealing with stresses that most of us never even dream about you know millions of people like trashing them or, or praising them and they're dealing with all that fame the pressure of going in front of millions and millions and millions of people, the money involved with that. I mean, these kids are like 15 years old and they're, you know, multiple six figures the second they join these teams. So it's, it's really interesting. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of crappy videos right now about it, uh, because it's mostly a, a broadcast streaming thing, but, uh, there's, there's a lot of room for some really artistic stuff there. You yeah, remember when, yeah. Watch I, playing I mean, gorgeous games. I mean, skateboarders when parkour started i met with a guy in new jersey and he's like do you want to come in and start shooting stuff around parkour and i had three kids and i was like uh i can't do that because there was zero money in hindsight i probably should have because i think the guy's still in the industry and i could have built an entire business around specializing uh you know in creating movies and videos around parkour um but i think that that's uh that's great uh to to bring that up caleb i think that that's uh an area and if you're if you're interested in that particular area anyway if you're an audience member then that's just like the being interested in food or travel like get out there and say i'm going to do don't say you're going to do a feature-length documentary film this is the big mistake I think a lot of people make. They go, I don't know if I want to do doc or narrative or am I going to be in the corporate space? And they say, oh, I'm going to shoot a documentary film. And then like three fucking years later, excuse my French, you know, there's still like seven hard drives worth of shit again. Yeah. And they, they're they like, uh, I'm so overwhelmed right now. And, uh, you know, that boat has sailed. Just say, I'm going to create a documentary short. I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a five to 10 minute piece on this person and the world that they live in and just spend a month, you know, on and off with that person and cut together something and uh, have a vision in terms of how you want to shoot it, you know? And, yeah. and again, don't make it about the gear, but do have a, an idea about how you want it to look so that it doesn't feel like a jumbled mess. Like you're throwing a camera into the car and you're showing up at the location and it's like, I'm going to get a shot that I might get in here. It's like, okay, I'm going to shoot everything with a large modifier with soft light and this and that. And think about the look and feel of what this piece is going to be before you actually start to shoot it. Because ultimately, um, that's what's going to set you apart. And it's also going to be something that sort of lays down sort of your, your approach to this, especially if it's an area that is just like you said, um, you know, just 
the potential for explosion in that, in that area for content creation is really high, right? Um, wouldn't you say? It sounds like it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah. even think about it. I mean, that's not even an area I would even think of. Yeah. So. No, it's 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 unbelievable. And it's in, in the eyes are there. It's not just, you know, trying to break into any old industry. It's just there's people dying for more content on these teams because there's only a certain amount of games and seasons. Um, so there's all this downtime where the fans just can't get enough. So, I mean, you could sign with a team and like be shooting, you know, like there's there's a podcast filmmakers drinking bourbon, which someday we should have those guys on because oh, we should 100 percent. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're wonderful. But they had um, this film, this uh, filmmaker who he he is there is the music video guy for 21 Pilots. It's a band. Yeah, at least 21 Pilots anyway. And uh, that's his full time gig is literally their video guy. So he's traveling, shooting, making docs for them, short videos. I mean, you could find you could do something like that easily for some of these teams or or any totally. industry, really. But yeah, well, there's a lot more money in that. I mean, one of the areas that I was looking at because I just thought it was fascinating. It says is uh, cosplay. You know, that's explosion. You know, with with all of these, you know, with these, uh, you know, comic cons and everything else. Um, I kind of found out that you know, unless you're really on the high end, there's not a lot of money there. Um, but if there's already money within an industry and you can identify and not come into it with the idea that you're necessarily going to be their videographer on the road, but that what you're doing is you're coming in and producing a piece and then going to somebody else and producing another piece, um, you could build a unique production company that specializes in creating content for that particular industry. Why not? And if there aren't a lot of them right now, then uh, that's the you know that's the time to get in there and start to create some of that content. But you yeah. got to don't forget the hump. Three times longer than you think. Mm -hmm. It's not you know it's not like oh I'm going to go do this little mini doc and then shit I'm like making the you know a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year because I'm you know the king of the castle here. Because don't think that you're the only person who's going to come in and do it. So that's why you have to have a vision. You have to think about how you're going to create that. And that's where the craft side of it and everything else comes in. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's some funny comments going on over there. Uh, ben, parting words for our uh, peeps out there in uh, Cameron Flask land. I hope some people have actually had some drinks today uh, other than Spotted Cow. But uh, Ben? Feelings? Feelings? I don't know. Well, it went. Uh, no, yeah. You mean about what we've been talking about or just a general sign? Just like parting parting words or, or you know, feelings about what uh, Caleb brought out or, or just anything related to sort of thinking about um, going forward as a content creator today in sort of this um, – you know, environment that we're in with all of this in-house and then, yeah. you know, and that kind of stuff. Well, I think it's the, the theme through a lot of what we've been talking about seems to be it's finding finding niche, finding something that you're just carving out your little hole, your little your little niche, your stuff that's not in that. But if you've got that as your bread and butter and that you have an industry that it is that you build or a particular sport or genre that you're going after, then I think that's probably a good way to go. And that seems to have been, we've all said that throughout the discussion today. So, yep. Um, that's, that's my end thoughts. And more of that. Good. Um, I would agree with that. I think that uh, number one is passion for or interest in what it is that you're creating. Um, one of the reasons that, you know, that we wake up every day. Um, is as content creators to hopefully do something that's not only different every day, but something that we're interested in. And so the advice is, you know, find something that you're interested in and just keep plugging away at it. If you lose interest in it, then, you know, it's going to be hard for you to do it. So there, all of us, whether we're 20 or we're 50 or somewhere in between or even older than that, there's generally things that we figure out at a certain point in our life that are the things that we're interested in all of the time. They're subjects or areas that we really love and that whether it's work related or not, 
it's the thing that like, you know, we always keep coming back to as a hobby or something else. If you can identify what those things are or that one thing is and that you're never bored of whatever that is, then as a content creator, that's the market you should be going after because that's what you love. That's the thing. I love, you know, education and I love gear. And so I have tried to go down the lane of creating content around, um, you know, that subject matter. I'm never bored about that. And of course, lighting and craft and all of that. Um, I think Caleb, you know, what you do every single day has evolved over time and you can speak to this, but what you're doing is something that you love. And um, Ben didn't fall into, you know, going out to oil rigs and specializing in a particular industry because he has no interest in it whatsoever. I'm sure that there's some fascination to that and what's going on there. And so it's, um, you know, it's really important to, to have that continuous yeah. interest in whatever it is that you want to create content for. Because otherwise, we're you know putting ourselves into the same situation that a very vast majority of people on this planet are in, which is that we're trying to make a living for a paycheck as opposed to doing something that we love. And the reason we're doing this, and it's a scary industry to be in, and it's you know takes uh, cojones to do it, is that we have to you know hopefully like what we're doing every single day. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe Ben, you can take this out a little bit, but I, I've seen as with me that you go through these phases, but what mm. you do is you identify that you're interested in another area or you want to focus on something else and your content doesn't necessarily completely change, but you start to go down these other avenues and roads because if yeah. you only keep doing the same thing for the next five years, you're going to get bored. Is that correct? Yeah, you get bored, and there'll also be someone else will come in and start doing it as well. So, you know, what about you? Yeah, thing. I mean, Caleb, you you you're not creating the same content now that you created a year and a half ago. No, no, it all it always slightly changes. Yeah, and you get bored. You probably get bored of doing something, don't you? I mean, you 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 go down the yeah. lane. Sometimes you find that it works. And you're like, I I'm really interested in this for a short period of time. And you start using certain types of equipment and stuff like that. And you're like, and then once you solve that problem, you're like, I'm done with that. And then there's other things that you go down and you're like, this is like my lane for a long time and I'm going to do this. And then, uh, you know, and, and so it, it seems that way at least. And I'm sure that that will continue to be. Um, any last advice that you have, Caleb, or comments on that? I, I love what we've kind of built upon. Um, yeah, I think if uh, if you have any free time at all, start attacking that stuff, that stuff you really want to end up doing because, you know, I think all of us can get, I know when I did freelance, I got real comfortable doing the same old thing. I mean, I got to the point where it was this hundreds and hundreds of interviews and the lighting setup didn't tweak much just because, you know, you just get comfortable and lack of time and budgets keep dropping and, so got to be on the hunt for that next or where, you know, what got you here won't get you here. That's always stuck with me. I can't remember what book that's from, but uh, what got you to this moment won't keep you going if you want to, you know, keep up with inflation. <laughs> so yeah. got to got to be about that. And don't phone it in. If you feel that you're phoning it in, it's going to hit you at some point creatively. Yeah. Right. If you're phoning it in and you get into that that thing it's like you know one of these days i gotta get away from this freaking side lighting and let's go <laughs> just go straight to the ring light beauty channel stuff that's it i'm gonna backlight i'm gonna back key everything and it's gonna be like there's gonna be 30 modifiers in front of me it's gonna be insane um you guys are amazing as always and uh i always have a great time chatting with you. I love that we have people coming on a regular basis now. Um, we should point out that we are back to our regularly scheduled Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern next week. Caleb, you have uh, mentioned sort of a little hint to me about what you think next week's episode is going to be about. It's a doozy. Where the heck are we going with this? It's going to be uh, fun. Yeah. Next week, we're jumping into uh, the future of filmmaking gear. 
we're going to go way out. We're talking like, I don't know, 20, 40, 20, 30. Like, what's the next big thing? We all know, B, you know, we're not talking about RGB, you know, bigger sensors. We're jumping way out. We're, we're beyond all, 10 bit, 12 bit. None of that crap. What are we going to be sitting in our, in our little chairs on our porches? Yeah, on our, this is, this is oh, a my, my day. I preferred actual lenses. None of this computer science. <laughs> Machine <laughs> algorithms. Oh, oh and we cool. hope the audience got, we, we need some big numbers next week. We want our regulars and we want you guys to go out and get some other people. Um, yeah, this is like the sitting on the porch. This is the Benjamin Button stuff. We're yep. going to have to be, you know, getting down to business about, uh, we're not talking about necessarily even, are we going to be using cameras that are traditional in the way that they are? We want to look crystal ball, everybody's viewpoints on where this thing is going to go. And then original video review says, Caleb, you're in a great state of mind right now. Uh, Caleb Entire. is like hungry. He's going to go, he's, he's ready for dinner. It's it's family time. I have two, and then, two little munch and get munchkins to sleep and all that stuff. You know, you know how it is. You know, I do. Veteran. Speaking of veterans, thank you guys so much in the chat. Awesome, you guys, everybody. Are thank you. So, uh, we're building that baseline. You know, people will come and go, but uh, appreciate those of you who who are the troopers, those who salute on the other side of this screen. So appreciate you, and uh, always great to have you around. Yeah. Thank you guys. Take care and we'll see you next week, uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern. See ya. Good night.